Okay. Good afternoon. I'm Antonella Gasperini. Uh, I'm from the Arcetri Astrophysical Observatory in Florence. And uh, uh, I am also the national coordin coordinator of libraries and museums of ENAF. And in particular, I work toward the preservation of the historical and scientific heritage of Italian astronomical observatories. In my talk, I will pre present the role of Italian astronomers in the birth and development of the IAU and the organization of the first general assembly held here in Rome at Lincei Academy in 1922. Two important books uh, were, were published around the history of IAU. One, uh, it's, a, it's a new book uh, published, uh, published at the beginning of this year uh, by Anderson, Banek, and Masden, and the other one many years ago was published in 1994. But my talk will be focused on the Italian astronomers from an Italian point of view after a study of the documentation preserved in the historical archives. This project was conceived by myself together with Valeria Zanini from the Astronomical Observatory of Padua and Mauro Gargano from the Astronomical Observatory of Capodimonte in Naples and is a result of a long-term commitment undertaken by ENAF for the valorization of its unique and inestimable cultural heritage. It's still a work in progress and other historical research is yet to be completed, but for me it's a very great honor to present here our project. As you know, the International Astronomical Union was born during the Constitutive Assembly of the International Research Council held in July 1919 at Bruxelles with the aim to facilitate the relations between astronomers of different countries where international cooperation is necessary or useful and to promote the study of astronomy in all its departments, so in, in, the, in, the, in the transactions. The creation power process of the International Research Council started from some private preparatory conversations in which the North American George Hillary Hale had an important role. He supported strongly the constitutions in the various allied countries of a National Research Council, including those referring to the national defense, similar, similar to the one already working in the United States. Also, the Italian Vito Volterra was involved in a private meeting held in London in the spring 1919, together with some delegates of the Royal Society, the Paris Académie des Sciences, and the, Acad and the Lincei Academy in Rome. The Bruxelles meeting was the third inter-allied conference on international scientific, scientific organization. The first two were held in the previous year in London, in October 1918, during the war, and in Paris in November, a few days after the armistice. These conferences were the result of a long process undertaken by the Allied scientists during the war years to entirely reassess international scientific relationships. Vito Volterra. Vito, Vol Vito Volterra uh, was a famous Italian mathematician. Uh, at the beginning of a 19... He was professor of mathematical physics at the University of Rome La Sapienza, and he was a highly respected scientist in Italy and abroad, as witnessed by the impressive correspondence of 16,000 letters exchanged with 1,500 correspondents all around the world, preserved here, here in the historical archive at Lincei Academy. He was also an important political figure. In 1905, he was nominated a senator of the Kingdom of Italy and involved in the creation of many scientific institutions. In fact, Volterra founded the Italian Physical Society in 1897. In 1907, he created the Italian Society for the Progress of Science, inspired by an analogous French and British organizations with the aim of the advancement and popularization of science. In 1917, inspired by the foreign colleague, colleagues and by the war experience, Volterra created the Invention and Research Office to use technological knowledge for military purposes. His aim was to put Italy on the same level as the other scientifically advanced countries. During the first Interallied inter Conference in London, a provisional commission, the first IRC executive commission then confirmed in Paris and Bruxelles, was charged to formulate a general plan of international organizations for needs of different branches of scientific and industrial researches. 
Volterra himself insisted on the necessity that this commission should take immediate, immediate resolutions on international geodetic and astronomical studies, which by nature cannot be interrupted or delayed. So, during the second Interallied Conference in Paris, under the name of the Astronomical Union, an international association was formally established, whose aim was the general progress uh, uh, of astronomy and related science and arts. In Paris, the first executive, commi executive commission was also established, and it was composed by Benjamin Fl Bayot, Alfred Fowler, and four vice presidents, William Campbell, Frank Dyson, Georges Lacquant, and the Italian, Annibale Ricco. In my talk, I will, brief, I will briefly focus on biographies of some Italian astronomers, and now I will spend a few minutes uh, on Annibale Ricco. Annibale Ricco, in uh, 1890, he had the first chair of astronomy in Italy at the University of Catania, and became the director of the local observatory. He remained director until his death in 1919. He was a member of the Lincei Academy. Lincei Academy had, had a role very important for all this story. Uh, and who, he won the Lincei Prize for Astronomy for his studies in solar physics. He organized and participated in some, uh, some, you know, some astronomical expedition for the observations of solar eclipses in many countries. Uh, he participated for Italy, together with the Vatican Observatory, as the, as the project Cardiusel. Ricco, who, as we have seen, was one of the four vice presidents of the first IU executive, executive committee, proposed the agenda for the first IAU, AIU Constitutive Assembly, which will take place as soon as circumstances permit and possibly coincide with the meetings of the Constitutive General Assembly of the International Geophysical Union. Those ma circumstances materiali materialize, mate materialized in the third Interallied Conference, which generated the IRC and officially established the IOU, which was born simultaneously with the restored peace in Europe in 1919. So, the funding nucleus of, uh, of the IIU was constituted, but Italy was not formally included among the members, as can be seen from the letter Alfred Fowler sent to the directors of the Italian observatories in July 1920. Alfred Fowler wrote, the General Secretary presents his compliments to the members of the International Astronomical Union and has pleasure in informing them that the conditions laid down at the Bruxelles Conference for the formal constitution of the Union have been fulfilled. The countries which have definitely, definitely signified their adherence to the Union are Belgium, Canada, France, Greece, Japan, United Kingdom and the United States. In addition, it's understood the steps towards joining the Union have been taken by Australia, Italy, and South Africa. The letter concludes, it's hoped that members of the various commissions will do all that is possible to promote the objects for which the Union has been constituted. But now, our question is, if Italy was actually a de facto IAU member from the beginning, why does Fowler talk about it as a later associate member? The reason can be found partly in the lack of a national body, the national committee, which, according to IAU rules, had to be the link between Italian astronomers and the IAU. IAU. Furthermore, furthermore, on September 1919, Annibale Ricco died suddenly, followed on December by Elia Milosevic, director of the Observatory of the Collegio Romano, and Ricco's successors, successors in the IAU executive committee. Therefore, an active Italian participation was missing for several months until Antonio Betti, the Dean of Italian Astronomers and the Director of Accetri Astrophysical Observatory, was appointed as IAU Vice President. But the primary reason was that the formal IAU membership was subjected to a payment of an annual fee of 12,000 French francs, not yet paid by Italy in July 1920. In the meantime, Italian astronomers decided to rearrange the Società degli Spettroscopisti Italiani, Ginevra Tinchieri told in the, in the last uh, talk. The first international society devoted to stellar and stellar physics research. Um, 
Its newly appointed organizing committee was composed by Antonio Cerulli, founder of the, Obser of the, Obser the Astronomical Observatory of Teramo, um, Azzelio Bempora, the director of the Astronomical Observatory of Capodimonte, Emilio Bianchi, the new director of the Observatory of Collegio Romano, and the physicist Antonio Garbasso and Vito, Vol Vito Volterra. Vito Volterra was a real driving force behind the Italian participation in the new international scientific arena in this period. During the Bruxelles conference, Annibale Ricco proposed to hold the first IAU General Assembly in Rome, together with the first General Assembly of the International Geophysical Union. All the astronomers accepted the proposal with enthusiasm, but the upcoming international meeting urgently needed at least a national authorizing committee to provide for the logistic and scientific organization. Due to the lack of a national research council in Italy, which will be formally established only in 1923, Volterra founded an astronomical temporary committee during the establishment of the new astronomical society. The Comitato, Nazionale, the Comitato Nazionale Italiano Astronomico, the National Astronomical Committee, was the official body to represent Italy within the International Astronomical Union. This board, this board was officially announced during the first meeting in Rome in 1921 of this National Astronomical Committee, and it was just the entire organizing committee of the new Astronomical Society. Within the board, Emilio Bianchi was appointed as secretary. But the problem were not finished. The organization of the 1922 Joint Assembly was finally made operational. The board estimated the cost of 100,000 lire and submitted an economic request to the Italian government, the foreign affairs and the economy ministries. Thanks to Volterra, the Lincei Academy offered its headquarters as a venue for the two general assemblies and established the date as starting from April 1922. However, Italy still had the unsolved problem of paying the IIU membership fee, either for the past year 1920 or for the current year, as Fowler himself wrote to the secretary of the National Committee, Emilio Bianchi. Fowler wrote, I've been reminded by Monsieur Bayot the position, of, the position of Italy in relation to the International Astronomical Union is somewhat anomalous. From the formation of the Union, it has of course been assumed that it was the intention of Italy to join and to contribute to the funds in accordance with the scheme agreed upon at Bruxelles. No doubt, the delay in forming the National Committee has been unavoidable and accounts for the delay in the formal adherence of Italy to the Union. I should be greatly obliged if you would be good enough to inform me if steps have now been taken towards joining the Union and whether the subscription for the year 1920 as well as for the current year may be expected. So, the Italian board used a part of the public education ministry funds to regulate the 1920 subscription. On August, President Bayot received from Italy the bank check for 12,000 uh, 12, francs. The following month, finally, Fowler communicated to Antonia Betti the formal membership of Italy to the IIU. This is the official document that ratified the decision. And, uh, the, and Alfred Fowler said to Professor Abetti, Dear Professor Abetti, no doubt you have already been informed that Italy has now formally adhered to the IIU and that, on behalf of the Executive Committee, Monsieur Bayot has accepted the invitation to hold the General Assembly of the Union in Rome on April. In the following months, Italian astronomers had a heated debate uh, to provide the General Assembly with an efficient local organization and fruitful scientific contributions. The archival documentation we studied showed clearly the fundamental importance of Giorgio Abetti. Indeed, Fowler discussed the scientific problem, uh, program, especially with him, Giorgio, Giorgio Abetti, son of Antonio, who was the main reference in Italy for the British and American astronomers because of his astronomical training spent in USA. Here I spend a few words, about, uh, few words on Giorgio Abetti, in particular to describe his link with the North American astronomers. 
In fact, Giorgio Abetti completed his studies in 1908, going to the US, first to Yerkes Observatory and then to Mount Wilson. And during this period, he worked with Philip Fox and George Hillary Hale. At the end of the war, he was nominated military attaché at the Washington Embassy as Delegate of Invention and Research Office, and he remained in the US until December 1918. In this period, he re-established the contacts with the US astronomers, and these relationships were very important, not only for the organization for the, of the first IAU General Assembly in Rome, but also because he succeeded in obtaining funds from the Hale Foundation and the US National Science Foundation for the construction of the solar tower in Arcetri in Florence. In the meantime, he had become director of the Arcetri Astrophysical Observatory. The importance of Giorgio Abetti uh, is, uh, consists also in the fact that in 1929, Giorgio Abetti was nominated to prepare a review for the Handbook der Physik, an editorial initiative that marked the state of the art of the international astrophysical research. He was responsible for the section dedicated to solar physics. As a consequence, Abetti's international role in this particular field of astrophysics was consolidated. Giorgio Abetti was also for many years IAU vice president. Uh, there you can see the years. Uh, but, um, allora, um, now, Giorgio Abetti, now we have to go back. Uh, for the final phases of the first uh, IAU General Assembly preparation, because it was decided that this, the, the scientific preparation of the IAU General Assembly would be carried out by standing committees on the basis of proposals by the national committees. Many proposals were suggested by the Italian astronomers, and you, and, and you can see here the main contribution, but in particular, we have seen before, the Italian Astronomical Committee was the only one to send a proposal for the commission number one, de la Relativité, to verify the relativistic theory in the gravitational field of Jupiter by analyzing stellar movement near the planet's disk and studying the apsidal motion of its fifth satellite, Amalthea. Meanwhile, the other international interaction uh, proceeded, uh, especially with Emilio Bianchi, secretary of the National Committee, who was going to become the new director of the Brera Observatory in Milan. Very few words about Emilio Bianchi. Emilio Bianchi would become the most important architect of the scientific policy in Italy during the fascism. He realized uh, some important uh, observatories, the astronomical station of Carlo Forte close to Cagliari, and uh, also he created the Admirate on Brianza Hills, a branch of Milan Observatory. Um, from 1913 to 1919, he worked mainly as a National Institute of Aeronautics, employed by military, military authorities, and his studies in aeronautics were very important, and for many years they remained a reference point. But let's go back to the organization of General, of general Assembly. Fowler and Bianchi, decided to postpone, to postpone the conference date from April to May because of a concomitant conference of railway people concerning the International Geophysical Union. Thus, the meeting was scheduled for May from 2 to 10, 1922. Finally, Alfred Fowler asked Antonio Betti to prepare the meeting program. In January 1922, Fowler informed Abetti that the agenda was still to be defined because the proposal of American astronomers were late. Anyway, in March, the program was then outlined and approved by Fowler. The program is very interesting and I think we shall all be pleased with the arrangements which have been made by our Italian colleagues. At the beginning of 1922, however, the problem of the annual Italian fee came back again because the government had not paid the 20,000 lire for 1921, and there was no guarantee that they would comply with international agreements for the following decade. The National Astronomical Committee obtained by the ministry only one half of the sum, so the board proposed to cover the remaining 10,000 lire with funds provided directly by the Italian observatories. On March 1922, Bianchi was then forced to ask the directors of the observatories to contribute to this amount proportionally to their own annual budgets. 
The request, of course, caused great dissatisfaction among Italian directors, who were already struggling with a persistent and structural shortage of funds for research. But almost on no one withdrew. As, a count, as a, the director of the Turin Observatory, Giovanni Boccardi, wrote, the, no, the honor of our country is at stake here. So you can see the letter. Eventually, the fundraising made it possible to pay the registration fee for 1921 and thus to avoid hosting the first IAU General Assembly without being officially a member because of lack of payment of the registration fee. Despite all of the political and economical difficulties, the conference finally commenced. On the 2nd of May 1922, the inaugural ceremony took place in the Great Hall of Orazio and Curiazzi in Campidoglio, at the presence of the King of Italy, Vittorio Emanuele III, with the welcome addresses of Vito Volterra, President of the Organizing Committee, of course, of Monsieur Bayou, President of the AIU, of Lalman, President of the International Geodetical and Geophysical Union, and of the Ministers of Public Instruction, Antonino Nile. Vito Volterra, in his welcome speech with fervent tones, focused on the general debate between scientific specialization and the universality of the knowledge, and suggested the conciliation, the conciliation in the coexistence of, the, of these two different approaches. Furthermore, uh, Volterra highlighted that general, general relativity was verified for the first time during the 1919 solar eclipse, thanks to astronomical observation. He wrote, and he said, of course, now in the history of science, it's not the first time that astronomy serves as control and test. Without astronomy, the velocity of light propagation would have not been discovered. The opening meeting of the General uh, Assembly was held here, of course, at the Academy, on the 3rd of May, under, uh, under the presidence of Bayou and Vincenzo Cerulli, on, the ho on behalf of the local committee of Italian astronomers, welcomed the Union, reading the inaugural speech. In this talk, Cerulli launched a vibrant appeal for opening IAU to all nations. He wrote, life conditions of our union is a universality. It's necessary for the union to be extended to all the people of culture. The distinction between participant and not participant must be eliminated. So the assembly began. The or the many participants, uh, there are also here the, the signatures, and 32 standing committees were engaged in discussing international astronomical work. The Italian astronomers attended 18 of them, even though only Cerulli covered the presidential position in the Commission Observation Physique des Planètes. Within the Commission number 12, Atmosphère Solaire, the role of Italy in the observation and study of prominences was finally recognized. The only negative point for Italy was the non-participation of the Catania Observatory in the work of the Commission Cardiusiel, considering that the contribution from Catania represented about one-tenth one -tenth of the whole work. This was because Rico has died, and there was no successor for the direction of the Astrophysical Observatory of Catania and for the guidance of the International Catalog Project. The first IAU General Assembly also included some social events, of course, you know, as every conference, and post-conference excursions. On the 10th of May, the participants were received by the Pope uh, Pio XI in Castel, in Castel Gandolfo. Here you can see very smart and elegant uh, astronomers. Uh, <laughs> and then the participants went also to Tivoli, Villa d'Este, more casual in this occasion <laughs> than in the other. And then the, um, in, on May uh, 12, uh, the astronomers went to Florence. The Florentine excursion was a tight schedule of meetings and visits. The most exciting experience was certainly the visit to the Specola, where astronomers from all over the world held Galileo's telescope, you can see there, in their hand, as documented by some photographs preserved in the historical archive of Arcetri Astrophysical Observatory. You can see the face very satisfied. <laughs> Uh, and then 
uh, from the center of the city, the astronomers climbed the Hachetri Hill and visited the last home of Galileo, Villa Gioiello, the Astrophysical Observatory, and the Institute of Physics. The memory of this day, a journey, you can see here the participants at the Hachetri Astrophysical Observatory, the memory of this day, a journey through science, art, and nature, was commemorated by Giorgio Abetti with a celebrative scroll in Florentine flowery style, signed by all the participants. It was a twice memorable day because not only astronomers from all over the world met together in the, pla in the places of Galileo, but because in 1922, the 50th anniversary of the Archetri Observatory Foundation was occurred. And here we have a surprise. Because here we have the original scroll with the original handwritten signatures of the, the, of the participants. If you want, uh, then after a uh, look, it's here. <laughs> Just a few words for the conclusion. We cannot forget the, that while the first IAU General Assembly was taking place, Italy faced a difficult period of, of political instability and intense social unrest, which eventually led a few months later to the march on Rome and the takeover of the fascist party. In the following 20 years, Italy was then drawn into the tragic fascist maelstrom that peaked in the criminal Russia laws promulgated by, Mu by Mussolini between September and November 1938 and accepted by, mo by most of the Italian middle class. In addition to tens of thousands of innocent citizens, hundreds of scientists were victims of this racist policy, passively received by almost the entire Italian academy, academic world. Volterra himself, chief actor in the Italian internationalization of science, fell victim to the fascism purges. In 1926, Volterra was not renewed, renewed either as president of CN, uh, CNR, he created in 1923, or as president of the Academia of the Rinchai Academy, because he had signed in 1925 the manifesto of the anti-fascist anti intellectuals written by Benedetto Croce. In 1931, he was removed from his office and forced to retire because he refused to swear allegiance to fascism. Later, he was expelled from all the Italian academies and then hit by the 1938 Russian laws. Italian science and astronomy greatly suffered by the expulsion of Jewish scientists. We quote uh, among astronomers and mathematicians Guido Andartura, Zelian Giulio Bempera, Luigi Iacchia, Tullio Levi Civita, Federico, uh, Federico Enriquez, Bruno Rossi, Emilio Segre, and also Enrico Fermi, who even though not a Jewish himself, left Italy to protect his Jewish wife. But during the fascist, year, the fascist, fascist era, the Italian astronomical technology grew up. The Archetri Solar Tower was completed in 1925, especially thanks to the great skills and international reputation of Giorgio Abetti. The new observatory of Rome was projected in Monteporzio Catone, and in particular, in 1942, was established the Asiago Astrophysical Observatory. It was the biggest telescope in Europe for many years. However, the cultural impoverishment generated by fascist rule soon confined Italy to a marginal role within the IAU and turned it away from almost all international scientific cooperations. Relations between Italian astronomers and scientists worldwide were resumed only after the Second World War. The Second Italian IAU General Assembly, held in 1952 again in Rome, marked a new beginning for Italian astrophysics. But this is another story. Thank you very much.
Sì, posso, ok, posso vedere cosa sì, è prossimo? Sì, sì. Ottimo. Lascio la luce. Ah, ok. <coughs> Hello, um, my name is Paul Muller. I am the vice director of the Vatican Observatory. Much to my surprise, because I'm not an astronomer. It's wonderful to find myself invited to be with you um, as kind of an alien species, but my own field is history and philosophy of science. I came to the Vatican Observatory nine years ago as religious superior of the Jesuit community, house mother, you might say. Um, and it's when, when Guy Consolmagno became director, I guess four years ago, he asked me to serve as his vice director. So I'm faking it as an astronomer and learning from you as I go. I mentioned, I expressed Guy Consolmagno's regrets for not being here. He is in the United States at this time and I am substituting for him. On a personal note, many of you may know our former director at the Vatican Observatory, Jose Funes, perhaps some of you. I just, even as I sat here now, I received a text message that his mother died um, just um, over the weekend. So you might, if you know Jose, think of him. Um, I'd like to just spend a few minutes discussing, if you will, some prehistory of the Vatican Observatory's involvement with the IAU in its early years. This will be more about the Vatican Observatory than the IAU, but it leads up to the IAU involvement and I think highlights, I think a way that's interesting for me at least, the sort of political issues involved in the fact that the IAU has member states. I think it's an interesting structure. So this will lead up to the um, involvement of the Vatican Observatory in the General Assembly of 1922. I have brought with me the guest book from when um, the delegates visited at the Vatican Observatory in 1922 and 52. The signatures are in that book. You can take a look. Most of my talk, the, the crucial figure is the one in the middle here, Angelo Secchi, who many of you probably know. Um, he's the crucial figure for the Vatican Observatory's, I think, historical account of its participation. So I'll start with him. Um, you may know last year was the 200th anniversary of Secchi's birth, and so there was a lot of attention to him. He was born in a small town in northern Italy, Reggio Emilia, entered the Jesuit order in 1833. An interesting time, barely 20 years after the Jesuits came back into existence after being suppressed. He went through the normal Jesuit formation in philosophy and theology, but in 1848, when he was newly ordained a priest, the Jesuits were temporarily expelled from Rome, as tended to happen to Jesuits through history, they always getting expelled. Um, Secchi fled Rome and found refuge in, um, at Stonyhurst College in England, where he was introduced to astronomy, and then at Georgetown University in the USA, where he came into contact with American physicists and meteorologists. By 1850, he was back in Rome, and at the young age of 32, he was named director of the Astronomical Observatory at the Jesuits Roman College, which under his leadership was enlarged and improved, and in fact, they installed telescopes on the roof of the Church of St. Ignatius, and with these improved facilities, it was named the Pontifical Observatory. I would say that the Observatory of the Roman College, as well as the one at the Tower of the Winds in the Vatican, and the one at the Campidoglio, these three Pontifical Observatories are all, in some sense, progenitors of the current Vatican Observatory. Secchi's contributions to astronomy are well known. He, um, among other things, observed the spectra of thousands of stars and developed an early system of stellar classification. He's recognized for this as one of the fathers of astrophysics. He also did outstanding work in terrestrial magnetism and solar physics. And an acknowledgement of this, the NASA mission STEREO, Solar Terrestrial Relations Observatory, carries an instrument package with the name SECI, Sun Earth Connection Coronal and Heliospheric Investigation. He also did important work in limnology, the Secchi disc at Wright, which he invented in 1865, is still a standard tool for measuring water clarity in lakes and oceans. Secchi, and now I come to my point a little bit more, did fine work in meteorology. He participated in the Universal Exposition of 1867 at Paris, representing the Holy See as director of the Observatory of the Roman College, and he won a gold medal for his meteorograph, 
a device of his own invention and construction which recorded weather conditions automatically. And he himself was made a member of the Legion of Honor. Now, in that period, 1867, uh, a period of no small antipathy between the Catholic Church on one hand, under the leadership of Pius IX, who by that point in his papacy had kind of, um, shall we say, become a bit anti-modern and not a great friend of science. And on the other hand, currents in Europe, which were strongly anti-clerical, it was interesting and no, of no small note that a priest would win, be honored in this fashion. The honors accorded to Secchi were interpreted by many as a victory for the church politically. Secchi himself wrote in his diary, hurrah for religion and the cassock that more than me myself were crowned today. Three years later, in 1870, Secchi was appointed, again representing the Holy See, as a representative to the commission to plan a convention to redefine the meter at Paris. But that very year, 1870, marked the fall of Rome, the seizure by Italy of almost all the remaining papal territories, including the Roman College, where Secchi's observatory was located on top of Church of St. Ignatius. So for the next 59 years, until the signing of the Lateran Treaty in 1929, the status of the Holy See as a political entity is at issue. After 1870, Pope Pius IX was calling himself the prisoner of the Vatican and was insisting, over against Italy, on the continued existence and autonomy of the Holy See as a political entity. Oops, I should have gone on to other pictures. There we go. Uh, here's the, here's the uh, fall of Rome, and here's Pope Pius IX in his corpulent splendor. Okay, forgive me for that one. Back to um, Secchi. In 1872, two years after the fall of Rome, the commission to redefine the meter, meeting in Paris, expressed its wish that Father Secchi continue as a member of the commission to redefine the meter, despite the quote-unquote change conditions of the Holy See. Italy protested, naturally enough, on the grounds that the Holy See no longer existed as a country. In the end, um, Secchi continued on the committee and Italy left the committee. This was seen as a personal triumph for Secchi and as a diplomatic success uh, for the Holy See. Upon returning to Rome, Secchi was received in audience by Pope Pius IX and Secchi wrote in his diary that the Pope welcomed me with hand raised, saying, I vote for Secchi. My point in rehearsing this history is to underline that Secchi's visibility and his scientific reputation proved to be useful politically and diplomatically to the Holy See and in the court of public opinion. It was not lost on the Holy See that scientific work and achievement, in addition to adding to the treasury of human knowledge, could provide a kind of diplomatic and political leverage. Fast forward, in 1887, nine years after Secchi's death, Barnabite priest Father Francesco Densa organized an exposition in the Vatican of scientific instruments made by Italian priests in celebration of the jubilee of Pope Leo XIII. Densa had been Secchi's student and had continued his work. Um, at the conclusion of this exposition in honor of Pope Leo, Densa suggested that the instruments be kept and uh, maintained, and, and that a, a permanent staff be formed to use them for scientific purposes. Pope Leo XIII agreed. So here's a little picture of the exhibition with a bust of Secchi, circled it up or right. Anyway, following the suggestion, Pope Leo XIII refounded the Vatican Observatory, which had been out of existence since 1870. His stated purpose in doing so, as spelled out in his motu proprio, ut mysticam, was that so that everyone might see clearly that the church and her pastors are not opposed to true science, true and solid science, whether human or divine, but that they embrace it, encourage it, and promote it with the fullest possible devotion. That remains part of the mission of the present day Vatican Observatory, to do good science, but in part for that reason. Um, if I may borrow, I'll uh, come back to that. Um, let me skip that for the moment. Going back to um, Pope Leo's foundation of the observatory in 1891, what Pope Leo did not say at that time in his motu proprio 
but I think what may be inferred is that the refounded Vatican Observatory served not just scientific reasons, but also political reasons. Uh, this was in 1891, and Pope Leo was still prisoner of the Vatican, and the political status of the Holy See was still at issue. It may be inferred that in refounding the Vatican Observatory as a national observatory, Pope Leo was seeking to build upon and extend the sort of political and diplomatic capital that had been achieved through the international activities of SECI 20 years earlier. What do real countries have? They have a national observatory. And that's what the Vatican Observatory was named as in 1891. And from its very first year, it participated as one national observatory, among others, in the international collaborative project of the Carte du Cell and the astrographic catalog. It would take the Vatican Observatory another 27 years to complete that project, their exposures for that project. It's okay, all right. Thank you. Oh, by the way, the first plate, the very, if, I, if I'm not wrong, the very first plate for that project was made at the Vatican Observatory in 1891 in August. Anyway, during those 27 years, while the Vatican Observatory did its plates for that project, that whole time, the Pope is prisoner of the Vatican, and the status of the Vatican as a political entity is at stake. And um, the point is just that during all those years of the Vatican Observatory's participation in this project, the Holy See could find political and diplomatic advantage in having its own national observatory participating alongside other national observatories in this international project. I should point out, if this is a little side note, here's a, a typical carte du sale plate. The, um, as you well know the history, uh, well, this is the, the famous sis sister um, comp computers at the Vatican Observatory. Of course, the priests didn't do the data analysis for those plates, that tedious work. You had to have good technically proficient women do it. In the observatory's case, the women were sisters. They were with us for decades. Anyway, um, as I talk, oh, yeah, shall some, before I go there, so don't misunderstand me. I don't miss, mourn the fall of Rome. I don't think that the history should be different. Pope Paul VI, speaking on the occasion of the 100th anniversary of the fall of Rome, observed that the church's loss of power and property in 1870 was providential, in that it freed the papacy to play a more universal and humanitarian role in human affairs. I think it's also providential for the Vatican Observatory in the sense that it refocused the observatory's mission. Its mission is work in astronomy and astrophysics at a high level in a manner constant with professional norms, but also to promote, to promote um, to show that the church embraces, encourages, and promotes science with all possible energy, the words of Leo XIII. Uh, my own spit on that phrase, I like to borrow a phrase from John Paul II. For him, a big word was solidarity. That had great social resonance in Poland for him, but I kind of like to apply that word to the religion-science relationship for the Vatican Observatory. The mission is in part to promote the solidarity of faith and science. Just to go quickly here to show, um, in these first 30 years, after the refounded observatory, the entire Vatican becomes an astronomical observatory with no fewer than four telescopes under cupola on the Vatican walls. And as you see at number three, since astronomers are inherently lazy and don't like to go up and down the gap in the wall, they uh, got money from the United States to build a footbridge to connect the missing part of the wall, the American bridge, but you had a Mertz Equatorial Telescope, a Visual Telescope, a Heliograph, and of course, the Carte du Ciel Telescope, all there on the walls of Vatican City in those years. I'm almost done. What I was suggested to me was that if I rehearsed this little bit of history, maybe to try and spur with you a bit of discussion afterwards, maybe a lot of you know more about the IAU history than I do, this is just, so be, be ready to, uh, with questions and comments, to continue this discussion. Almost done. As you well know, the newly founded IAU held its first General Assembly at Rome in 1922. Uh, this gentleman, Cardinal Maffi, not Mafia, but Maffi, was at that time the president of the council overseeing the Vatican Observatory. He and Jesuit father Johann Hagen, 
who was the Vatican Observatory Director, both participated in the General Assembly as representatives of the Vatican Observatory. Cardinal Maffi was even named to the honorary committee organizing the assembly. But at this time, the Holy See was not a member state, uh, since its political status was dubious. The Vatican City State was admitted as a member state only in 1932, after the signing of the Lateran Treaty. So I just find this uh, an interesting tension, given the structure of the IAU and its structure of having member states, that um, a rather high level of participation was accorded to the Vatican Observatory at that time, despite it not being a member state, and despite the tensions that were there with Italy. Um, just an interesting, interesting history. King Eman I'm told that King Emmanuel, Victor Emmanuel presided over the opening session of the General Assembly on the Capitol Line with, remarkably enough, Cardinal Maffi at his side. The Stonyhurst Journal was a journal of the observatory of the English Jesuits, and it described the scene as follows. The presence of Cardinal Maffi in his robes with the King of Italy at the opening meeting of the Union in the Capitol Line created quite a sensation in Rome, as it is the first time such an event has happened since the entrance of Italian troops into Rome in 1870. For the occasion, his eminence, Cardinal Maffi, as if wishing to exclude any possible idea of an indelicate interference by the church, made the remark, here we are all astronomers. I'm presuming that today myself. <laughs> it should be noted that it was not only the Holy See which at that time was excluded for political reasons from the IAU having member state status. Several other countries, as we've heard, were excluded due to the political fallout of the recently concluded First World War. Keeping track of how and when various countries could be admitted as member states in the IAU kind of provides a sort of political barometer and shows that the international collaborative nature of modern science can serve to overcome political barriers and differences. As you know, the 8th General Assembly of the IAU was held in Rome in 1952. By that time, the Vatican City State was a member state. As part of that meeting, a trip to Castel Gandolfo was organized for more than 600 persons, participants in the assembly and their guests. Pope Pius XII received them in audience and made an address in which he not only praised the spirit of international unity and collaboration in the service of science and truth, which is at the heart of the IAU, but he also gave a semi-technical, cogent summary of progress in astronomy in the first half of the 20th century and since the founding of the IAU. Um, I will close with um, making a joke I often make. Uh, a weird thing about being at the Vatican Observatory is we get many visitors, and they always ask almost always the same question. Why on earth does the Vatican have an observatory, not knowing this history? It just seems odd to them because, of course, we all know that religion and science are somehow in conflict. And my somewhat snarky, obnoxious answer is, oh, the Vatican has an observatory because it cannot afford a particle accelerator. We, <laughs> we certainly wish we could, but it's beyond our means. Um, I'll close, and this is off topic, but I can't resist as long as I have the dais, the, 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 the floor here, just to call to your attention you know, again, this question, which is always there for us, the religion science questions. Uh, way back in 1870 and 1893, two documents from Vatican I and from Pope Leo, which I think provide the, the lens, the orientation for our participation in the world of science, but also for the Catholic Church's perspective on science and faith. And the basic presupposition here is that no conflict is possible. From a faith perspective, it is the same God who creates nature and reveals is revealed in scripture. And since God doesn't contradict God, truth doesn't contradict truth, there can't possibly be a conflict. And uh, Pope Leo develops that later by saying, look, if there's an apparent conflict, it's because we've understood either the scriptures or nature incorrectly. And if that's the case, try and figure it out. And if you don't succeed, be patient. If no such mistake can be detected, we must then suspend judgment for the time being. This is what I personally sometimes mourn, both in the world of science and the world of faith, is the unwillingness to suspend judgment for the time being. 
with that, um, I don't know how much time I took, but it was suggested that perhaps people more intelligent than I might have further comments on the history of the IAU in relation to the Vatican Observatory or in its early years in itself, or the faith science issue or whatever. But I will stop there for any questions, comments that you would care to make. May I suggest, Paul, that because people may have questions from the other speakers sure. today, so too, just maybe I'll just finish and then we could open Perfect. it up. Thank you. Let me have a seat here. So we've heard some uh, marvelous talks today about the past of the IU and the past of astronomy interfolded with the IU. And next we'll spend a few minutes looking uh, forward both for the IU and for astronomy in general. As we've just so eloquently heard from Paul, the IU was founded to foster international science collaborations and also from Antonella and, and the other speakers today, the Carta CL, we saw a marvelous picture, the astrographical catalog, were efforts that were ongoing. We've heard about the solar eclipse of 1919 and the expeditions for that. And so the IAU was founded to continue these collaborations and to formalize the international meetings. And as we've heard many times, the very first General Assembly was here in 1922. Of course, 100 years later, we're still sharing our science and collaborating on our astronomy, but the IAU activities have expanded to impact all areas, uh, including development, training, education, and outreach. Besides our nine scientific divisions, we have 35 commissions and 53 working groups covering all areas of astronomy and how they can relate to other areas as well. Evine mentioned that we have four offices using astronomy as a tool for outreach, training our young astronomers using astronomy as a tool for development, and the office that we're just in the process of establishing, and we hope to have it established by this fall, Office of Astronomy for Education will we'll use astronomy as a hook for impacting uh, younger uh, students and training their teachers and providing information about astronomy to use in the classroom. One of our working groups is on the dark and radio quiet sky protection. And as Veen mentioned, in the course of our 100 year activities, we have dark skies for all initiatives that include symposia and events that will help people worldwide understand not only is it important to preserve our sky so that astronomers continue to study it, but so that all of humanity continues to enjoy it. Another of our working groups is the global coordination of large-scale space and ground efforts. We, in 100 years ago, were trying to build bigger and bigger telescopes to collect photons like what our eyes can see. But we've expanded across the whole electromagnetic spectrum in the past 100 years, going now from gamma rays to x-rays to optical and infrared and radio. And we have many, many efforts on ground and in space that require international collaboration. We have, of course, the iconic Hubble Space Telescope, now 29 years in orbit. We have the James Webb Space Telescope in a couple of years, we hope we'll launch, and that will expand further to the infrared, probing to the very early moments of the universe. We have the European Extremely Large Telescope, a 39-meter telescope now under construction, and as Avine mentioned, hopefully a couple of other 30-meter class telescopes um, that are in the planning stages as well. We have the LIGO interferometers that are detecting gravitational waves in many facilities around the world. We have the ice cube array that's detecting neutrinos from the South Pole. Athena, we also heard mention an X-ray satellite among many other satellites that are being developed. The point about all of these facilities and so many more besides is that we really rely on international collaboration today. The scope of these is often decades for each of these to be planned and developed upwards of a billion dollars or more for the facilities, and at least thousands of scientists and engineers who together provide the expertise, the skills to make all of these a reality. So truly, we're in the global um, era, and as we've already heard earlier too, expanding beyond the photons that carry information, but the gravitational waves, the cosmic rays, the neutrinos, we're in the era of multi-messenger astronomy. 
So I expect in the future this will continue. We'll build bigger arrays and have bigger surveys. We've already got the Atacama Large Millimeter Array in Chile. We have the Square Kilometer Array in the process of being uh, formed, where we have prototypes such as the Meerkat in South Africa. South Africa and Australia are leading these uh, worldwide efforts to have more arrays. We've got the Large Synoptic Survey Telescope, which will, in a few years, survey the sky every few days and will collect information on billions of stars and galaxies. But in addition, we'll be able to study transient events, objects that move in space or that vary in time. We'll learn more about the cosmic microwave background as we extend to a global arrays that are in the process of being planned now. And of course, to continue to collect information about cosmic rays, such as with the Cherenkov Hawk detector in Mexico. So we expect that this will only grow larger and, and there's efforts planned for um, a large scale uh, space array that will look at gravitational waves from the most massive objects. I expect that in the next century we'll also see observatories beyond Earth that will have uh, possibly observatories on the moon or in orbit around the moon where the skies really will be a radio quiet and dark, perhaps even on Mars, although unlike this, this Arizona simulation, we won't have a blue sky on Mars. Um, in the next century, we'll undoubtedly continue to explore the solar system. We've already had many satellites going across the solar system, taking lovely pictures of planets and moons. We'll probably begin to explore more by actual landers on these planets, either robotically or perhaps eventually by people. Perhaps we'll explore the methane lakes of Titan, scoop up material from the dried riverbeds of Mars and, and, and bring them back. Um, we've got um, missions that are planned to Europa, possibly also to en Enceladus later. These are the icy giant moons of outer planets that are, are thought to harbor subsurface oceans and perhaps we'll be able to probe those oceans, bring back some of the material. We've already landed on asteroids and comets, but I expect in the next century um, there could even be some industries getting involved in the mining of the precious materials that we could bring back from there. It's of course impossible to predict what discoveries we'll have in the next century, but we can extrapolate from what we know of today, but we don't know much about. We know that there's dark matter because we can look at the gravitational uh, interactions of galaxies in a cluster of galaxies and understand that the gravitational force implies a mass much bigger than what we can detect directly from photons. Dark matter, by definition, does not radiate, does not interact with photons, but does have a gravitational attraction. We can look at the rotations of spiral galaxies and see that they're rotating faster in their outer parts than we would expect just based on the gas and stars and dust in the galaxies. So perhaps we'll be able to detect these dark matter particles. We've already heard from Avene, uh, as you know, that most, plant, most stars are thought to harbor planets, um, perhaps many planets, so the effort is on to find Earth-like twins among the thousands of exoplanets that we already know exist. We want to find Earth twins that are not only the same mass and size and therefore the same density, but to be able to characterize their atmosphere, to have one of these Earths not only in the habitable zone of their star, but also um, to actually have a habitable uh, atmosphere. Perhaps we'll even see the biomarkers in indicating at least primitive life forms. Perhaps we'll come to understand dark energy, that mysterious something that's causing the current acceleration of the expansion of the universe. Perhaps we'll come to understand gravity at the quantum level. We understand the other three forces, the strong and weak electromagnetic forces at the subatomic level. We can write down equations describing when they might have been unified. But although gravity dominates on the scale of the universe, we don't understand it at the subatomic level. So we can't describe it in, in the way that we can describe the other forces. Perhaps we'll detect what we're now calling the graviton, a placeholder for what would be the force particle of gravity. If we could do that, then maybe we could write down the math that describes the physics of the unification of the four forces before the Planck era. Perhaps we'll also detect a cosmic, micro, uh, cosmic gravitational wave background in the same way we've already discovered the cosmic microwave background, signifying when the first atoms were formed a few hundred thousand um, years after the Big Bang. Um, this would be an imprint in the matter distribution in these early times. With all facilities, we 
have certain goals in mind, but always there's a capacity for greater exploration beyond what we can imagine. So undoubtedly, in the next century, the biggest discoveries will be the current unknown unknowns. There are many goals that unify scientists from all fields. We're all entering the era of big data, and we need to work together to figure out how to access, archive, and analyze these huge data sets. New technologies in one field very often impact other fields. We have a new IAU 100 brochure on the application of astronomy to Wi-Fi, medicine, and other areas. Publishing standards in the era of all line, all, online everything um, are going to require more rigorous uh, watching so that we make sure that we have accurate information online. Peer review has been a hallmark of scientific publications forever, and we want to make sure that that continues. We also want to make available open access to data. We want to have access to data that underlies uh, the papers as well. So a lot of these efforts um, scientists of all types can work together on. As we've already heard, um, science policies are very important as astronomers want to continue worldwide collaborations and scientists in general want to work across boundaries and across governments. We need to make sure that that can still happen. Science is a universal language and therefore it leads to diplomatic efforts as well. And of course, science literacy is very important. This Big Ideas in Astronomy brochure just came out a few days ago from one of the commissions on education. And the idea is to promote certain key knowledge in astronomy, uh, which would be spread uh, around the globe. So similarly, we would like people to understand everywhere, science in general, what, un what constitutes science, what are some of the key ideas that have been discovered, and why should we continue to care about it? Why do we want science? Not only for the basic knowledge that we can get about the world and the universe in which we live, but also to impact our economies, in impact the development of our worlds. We want people to understand that these things are tied together. To look at just one of these areas on big data, um, we can imagine what the computational power will be like in the future. And here we have a plot. Uh, I'll give a shout out to my husband uh, for this one. Um, Bruce looking at the, the growth of information whoops, as a function of time. And we see that in the next decade, the world's data will grow by a factor of 50, so that we're approaching a yottabyte scale. A yottabyte, a million exabytes. An exabyte, a billion billion bytes. So a lot of data. Um, and so that upper arrow shows this, this growth. But the gray area there is the worldwide collection of internet data. The red is what scientists are using. So we're, see, we're being driven by the worldwide use of, of the internet. And that's a good thing because we'll have a lot of people beyond astronomers working on um, how to make use of these data. The Large Synoptic Survey Telescope coming online in a couple of years, the Square Kilometer Array, the Daniel K. Inouye Solar Telescope, which we'll see first light this fall, will collectively generate hundreds of petabytes of data. So even though that's a small amount of the total, it's still a significant amount of data that we need to deal with. So undoubtedly, machine learning applied to many different fields will be becoming uh, increasingly important in astronomy as well. When we do collaborations, we enrich society in many ways. I've already talked about applying the technology and tools of astronomy to different areas um, in medicine and economic, in, in, well, it impacts economics in electronics uh, and so on. Uh, but also astronomy, of course, pervades all cultures. Every culture has its own story about the formation of the universe and the formation of our world. And when we share those stories, we bring people a little bit closer together. Science, of course, is multidisciplinary today, and while we've often long made use of physics and mathematics in astronomy, we also have overlap today with chemistry and geology and even biology. So when we bring astronomy to people around the world, we can help impact the UN Sustainable Development Goals, particularly as regards to using technology to help economies and to teach people. We all know that the best science can happen when we have the most diverse and inclusive uh, group of scientists. So the IAU is part of the International Science Council Gender Gap in Science, which looks at the demographics of scientists of all types worldwide. Why is it that we have 13,000 IAU members from 100 countries, but only 18% women? Well, I must point out that we have 75% women officers right now, and over half of the speakers today were women, but still, globally, we have a long way to go. 
So we hope that this study will help lead to suggestions about how we can eventually achieve equity. The International Year of Astronomy a decade ago and the IU 100 events today are bringing uh, to millions of people globally the importance and excitement of astronomy. So this is designed to make everyone feel like they're part of it, that they can indeed do astronomy and appreciate astronomy. We also have partnerships with organizations such as COSPAR and UNESCO that are educational or, or that are training workshops to again make astronomy more accessible and in particular the tools and techniques used in astronomy which can also be applied in other areas. We've already heard about the Inspiring Stars ex exhibition traveling worldwide which will bring astronomy to the visually impaired. We also have efforts to include technical words in astronomy in sign language so that we bring astronomy to the hearing impaired. We have many symposia at IAU meetings on inclusion and diversity. And we have a code of conduct that we have adopted that's modeled after the International Science Council code that is designed so that all IAU activities make people feel not only welcome, but also safe. In the next 100 years, Undoubtedly, we will continue to become more inclusive and diverse so that eventually when photographs like this are shown from different regions, they really will reflect the two true demographics that we see so that everyone feels like they are part of astronomy and they can do astronomy. So in the next hundred years, we look forward to continuing to share astronomy as we all live and work under one sky. Thank you. I wonder whether all the speakers from today should come up so that people can ask questions of everyone. How, how would that be? Oh, if you want to have a look at the scroll. So. Oh, yes, and look at the scroll, too. But, yes, Evine and, yeah, Giancarlo and Nicole. I think if we all come up. As you wish. I'm, I'm going to stay seated. Please have a seat. Oh, it's okay. Yeah, I'm happy standing. <laughs> So I actually had a question uh, for Paul, uh, because uh, I was wondering, uh, you were talking about this tension between faith and religion. Um, I was wondering how many of the, the young people from the Vatican actually come to the observatory and uh, are exposed sort of to astronomy and then uh, go into a dialogue with you uh, or Guy about these questions. But how many people of who? Of, of, the, of the young priests and uh, oh. the, the, young, uh, the young members of the... So our young members are all Jesuits, so... Uh, of course, it's just the Vatican Observatory is entrusted to the Jesuits, so they're all Jesuit priests, so they're all automatically Catholic. We have a circle of adjunct scholars of various faiths, men, women, uh, who work with us, but, it, but that wasn't, I think the question was more like young people. What, what fraction of them actually ever come to the observatory or? The adjunct I, scholars? Yeah. At some point, they all, they all spend time with us at some point, okay. yeah. But they don't live with us, right? The, the Jesuits are residential. That's the residential staff. Sure. And these other folks will spend time. We have guest quarters for them. They'll spend time with us. But the young people question, I mean, I, certainly all of us will receive visitors and do talks and address these questions, but I wasn't quite sure if I knew which, which audience you were talking about. Well, more the, the young Jesuits who are, yeah. are passing through the observatory or are, uh, I don't know what fraction of them actually come. Yeah, not so many they, actually come to visit, but many of them study here at Rome or study elsewhere oh. and we're often called upon to work with them in class mm -hmm. and to study with them. Mm -hmm. Sylvia? Thanks all of you for your uh, speeches, and, and I think uh, Deborah's uh, last uh, talk was very enthusiastic and really inspiring. But I have one specific question for Dr. Mueller. The, the Vatican uh, participation in IEU, uh, 
happened, but in a sense, I think IU wanted to say that only those members of uh, International Research Council were accepted, and that was the excuse to let the, all, all the other members in Europe not to be participate. So I don't know what happened. Was the Vatican also part of the International Research Council, or how did IU so in, that. in what period of time? At, at the time at the, of the founding? At the, at the beginning, yes. At, at the, the time of the founding, I, you had to be a government to be part of the International Research Council. It was a governmental level thing. And at that time, the Vatican was not considered a political entity by Italy. So, so that did, was the tension. Wh when did it enter? So the, I think the Vatican became member state of IAU in 1932. But it was only in 1929 that it became possible, technically, because in 1929 is when Italy recognized the Vatican City State as a country. So it didn't exist as a country from 1870 to 1929, at least according to Italy. And so it could not, it didn't have the, the technical or the, the, the status to be a member state at that time. Well, and, and I just want to mention also that IAU, after all, has done its diplomacy work also with the China members, uh, the, the, both the the Taiwan and the mainland China that what was able to make them uh, be members of IAU together. Yeah. So it's, it's part, it's, it, it has played its part in diplomacy, international yes. diplomacy. I just want to make sure everyone knows that the, the person just asking a question of us, Sylvia torres Pinebird, who of course is our past president. Yes, in fact, I want also to comment on this because indeed now we don't call member states, but we call national member. And, you know, if that was, if that concept which arose from the discussion about China was present at the time, probably you could have been member also at that kind time. Alternative history. But yes. However, I have a comment on your last slide where the two quotes Please. from. Um, uh, Filius Dei and Providentissimus yes, uh, Deus. I just want to know that those words are almost verbatim. And in fact, the, this resemblance would be even better if it was the original text in Latin with uh, uh, Thomas Aquinas' yes. uh, Summa and, Theology. And, and one thing which is very critical for uh, evaluating that the, the wisdom of that sentence is that we have to some time to suspend judgment for a while. And that was done by Georges Lemaitre when before the uh, talk of Pius uh, XII at the General Assembly warned him, possibly through the Vatican specula, to avoid to uh, make a connection between the Fiat Lux and the, the Big Bang because that was premature. And now, having waited for a while, finally we have found the possibility of merging the uh, cosmological model, the current cosmological model with the concept of creation, resurrecting the concept of creatio continua from Thomas. So we have now no conflict. There is another aspect that I want to throw to you about another aspect that we have to, on which we have to suspend judgment, and that is connected to the previous one, and that is about the original sin. I, I just wanted to add that uh, during IYA 2009, when we had the privilege of visiting um, the Vatican, and we heard a, a speech from Pope Benedict, who was uh, just exactly along these lines, that, that he was talking about the beauty of the heavens and the appreciation of science in, in folding that together. So the message continues. If, if I may dive in, I think a point I try to make in my speaking is the issue with younger people especially, it's not so much worrying about a conflict of science and faith, it's that society in large, the very idea of faith and truth itself is at risk. I think science and religion have common cause in defending the notion that truth exists. So I wanted to ask a question about Italy coming into the IAU. And it's the following. As, as I recall, at the beginning of World War I, Italy allied with Austria-Hungary and then switched sides. That's where Alto Adige comes in and all this kind of stuff. Did that play a role in how the other countries saw Italy joining the Union? 
just wondering. Uh, I'm not sure that I have understood well. To, um... Well, Italy switched sides, and originally they were fighting with Austria-Hungary, were they not? No, no, no. That's, okay. Ah, no. thank you. No. Okay, good. I, I, I had misunderstood. Thank you. I was also very interested to hear about the founding of the Vatican Observatory. I just wanted to mention, when I talk to people and I say, you know, I'm going to go to the Vatican Observatory, I think their reaction about what you brought up about there's a Vatican Observatory, they'll immediately bring up the name Galileo. That, that's where that fundamental dissonance comes in. So, so I have a question for, for Ginevra. I think you mentioned that the um, astronomical, uh, Italian Astronomical Society has 45% amateur astronomer members, and, and therefore probably 55% are professionals. Okay. Are you promoting relationships between the amateur and professional communities within your society? There, there is a third component, which is not so much the amateur, but is more the uh, teachers, school teachers. I so see. it's 45, if I remember correctly, 45% is professionals, 35 is teachers, and then the other. Some of the amateur are also professional. I mean, it's in, in, in a lot of uh, cases, uh, somebody can be a professional and an amateur. Um, but uh, uh, the, the, the major uh, connection is between uh, professionals and school teachers. That's more... Um, it's perhaps a little bit unusual to have a society with such a, a, a mixed membership because in many countries, the professionals and the amateurs um, are uh, se yes. separated. Yes, most, most of the European um, societies have, uh, most of the major European societies have just professionals, but I've learned uh, that many, um, that there are several that have mixed uh, connections. Yes, so if I may add, the, the Astronomical Society of the Pacific is an example. Yes, with indeed. <laughs> So are there benefits, do you think, from having this mixed membership? Um, there are certainly benefits in the sense that it is no long, if it is no longer a purely scientific society, I mean, because science is done uh, elsewhere, um, it, it has the advantage that there is a, a, an easy um, official link between the Ministry of Education, in Italy we have a, a, a complicated issue because the Ministry is of University Research and Education. So um, we, with, with, the, with, the, with, the, with the society, we basically talk more to the I, the education um, of the, of the, of the, of, of the uh, ministry. With the professionals, we, we talk more about the U and the E because it's the uh, re uh, research and, and, uh, and university. Uh, so we basically cover the ministry from three <laughs> sides and, and try to nail it. And, and we don't really succeed very much because they have a mind of their own. But, that's, um, uh, but in, a, in a certain sense, we should have a privileged... Um, um, way to get to the education part of the ministry, uh, or at least we try. That's our goal. Mm -hmm. And indeed, we succeed in, 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 in for example, in this um, Olympiad. Uh, there, we, we, we have a very strict connection with one part of the ministry that uh, comes to, to the final, uh, comes to the, for our schools, for when we when we organize teacher uh, the training for teachers, um, or training for for children not children for students, uh, so in a certain sense, uh, for education is very important. Okay, thank you. Yeah, Yonichi. <laughs> 
and then, uh, in the mix up the members of the amateurs and the teachers and uh, uh, the professionals. The, uh, the, uh, in Japan, the Astronomical Society of Japan is also the, uh, the same situation and uh, the ha mo less than half her members is uh, professional. The most of the uh, people, uh, members uh, of the association is the uh, amateurs and the teachers, so that uh, it makes a very good effect to the co collaboration uh, between the amateurs, the teachers, education, uh, outreach aspect. So uh, I think it's a, a very good situation uh, in, uh, in realizing the, uh, the IAU uh, strategic plan to, to, adapt, to be adapted in the society and uh, our community. Sylvia, comment, and then Bruce. I just, I, I was very interested to see the picture of the, of the women astronomers in, in the Vatican presentation, because the only example that we have are the Harvard astronomers, the Harvard group, which are very famous now, but it's very important to learn that other things were happening all over the world. I don't know if somebody else has information about their own countries, but I, I was, uh, I would be very interested if you will allow I, me to have that, that I could photograph. certainly send the yes. picture, but I think it was not uncommon at all for re scientific institutions to have women in the back room doing I, the hard work. Uh, I also have noticed that in the Italian delegation in 1922, there was one woman out of seven, eight, so... No, but in the, the Italian delegation was eight, nine members or, or uh, participants, and one of them was woman. It was a woman, so just mention. Yeah, so I can't help but notice a theme today of increasing unification, both in our past century and in the future, and a lot of this has been social. Veen mentioned unification of types of science, chemistry and particle physics and computer and so on with astronomy. But um, I'm not aware of unification of the major societies. So the astronomy society, their chemistry societies, their physics societies, which are not so unified as far as I know. And so it makes me think maybe there's a role for some um, umbrella society or maybe there's a role for greater exchange of scientists among them or for or some kind of more emphasis on the interdisciplinary nature of science that we see in it, almost every field, a greater need for this. Yeah, and, and, and that's of course extremely important, but the International Science Council plays a part of that role at least in having, what, 40 some different scientific unions including now social sciences. And so part of these umbrella questions are starting to be tackled with a new strategic plan that they're developing. But, but yes, I think that that's particularly important as we're all facing big issues together. Yeah, I think you need a mix of the two. I mean, I think uh, um, one of my colleagues uh, always compares multidisciplinary research with um, a basketball player <laughs> who is pivoting. I mean, one leg, one leg is firmly placed in one sort of science and it stays there and then that other leg that moves around uh, before he or she throws the ball <laughs> uh, to the, the other fields like chemistry, like mathematics, like informatics, etc., etc. And at least in my own experience with multidisciplinary research, that's the way to do it, is to keep one, one leg firmly in one of the uh, pillars, uh, sort of uh, the sciences, and then uh, to move that other one around uh, that. So I think uh, that's also one of the challenges that something like the International Science Council has. It, it's almost too broad to, um, to tackle, uh, uh, to tackle the, the, the issues. So, but we need them also for other aspects. <laughs> the uh, I'm Gonzalo Dancredi from the Division of Planetary Systems and Astrobiology. And the question is for Mr. Mueller. Uh, I know that the Vatican Observatory has one of the largest collection of meteorites. And in particular, Coyconsolo Magno 
is in charge of that. My question is, are, I mean, the Catholic Church has a large network of uh, representatives all over the world. And for the meteorites, it's very relevant because meteorites could fall anywhere. Are you using this large network in order to collect meteorites or these meteorites just come for exchange with other uh, collectors? I'm probably not as well informed as I should be. This much I can say, actually our new curator of meteorites is Brother Bob Mackey. And just two years, last year, he hosted the first ever meeting of curators of meteorite collections to sort of organize institutional standards among them for loaning things out. That much I know, but the network for being aware of meteorite falls and sharing, this I'm not informed about, I'm sorry. But I'd be happy to put you in contact with Brother Mackey. Uh, for them to use yeah, that network. The, the, the from there, or it's that by... Yeah, at least what Brother Consumani, your Brother Mackey said is that 99.9% .9 of the people come with meteorites. It's not. So I don't know if the network would be useful that way. But at least they are trying to be organized internationally in terms of how they handle the collections. This much I know. I'm happy to put you in touch with Brother Mackey if you like. Okay, good. Um, I think this actually brings us to an end because we have a wonderful uh, visit coming up. Uh, we gather here, yeah, uh, sorry, at the, at the ground floor. Yeah, at the ground floor we gather because we're going to visit the Villa Farnesia to visit... Uh, firstly, the, firstly the, we, will, yeah. we have the occasion to visit the, the room where the, where the first General Assembly took place. So. Ah, okay, <laughs> good, good. Well, I want to thank everybody again for their, uh, uh, for their presentations, for their attendance, and of course for the Linté for hosting us, uh, Professor Giancarlo Setti, um, Thank you very much again for welcoming us and for being here in this wonderful afternoon. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the very